So cryptogenic stroke. So what I was asked to talk about was PFO, and I, you've got my title more than I do, but it's you know the truth. Um, okay, these are fun. So we have picked the theme here, as Rich brought up, which is these are all filled with controversy. Luckily, my topic, the controversy has settled a bit, but like Joe's topic, there's different opinions depending on what part of the bell curve you want to fall. Fortunately, since I do this procedure, I try and stay passionate and yet objective. That would be all of our goals. So cryptogenic stroke. So only the truth, or is it fake news? We'll see. That's my political comment for the, for the talk. Um, so here I am. Uh, that's my alma mater undergrad. I know in our place we put, starting with med school, and I'm pretty proud of this one, so I'll just throw this one up there. This is University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Um, and I don't have anything to disclose or conflicts. Cases come from our experience at Piedmont. Um, patients whose identities you'll see, and there's one I think that shows up, has given permission for such. And then this is my opinion, impacted by experience, supported by data that has become more robust of late. So good timing on my part. I've given this talk a few times, actually, at this meeting. And I was going back through it. And it's, it's ch the good thing is this talk changes a lot. The bad thing is I have to change my talk a lot because the topic has changed. And it's certainly come into full, strong focus in the last year and a half. So here we go. So these are strokes and what they look like. You have cryptogenic strokes that are up to 40% of the uh, population of strokes that we see out of the ischemic group. And then there's hemorrhagic strokes. And so if we focus on the ischemic, that's what we get. And next, this is just a quick, and I'm going to move through these slides quickly because we wanted to allow time at the end for questions. So I hope that's how this works. So I've tried to be very uh, mindful of time. So this is just a quick cartoon of what these PFOs look like. And as we go through with our staff and training, uh, ASD, PFO, ASD is a permanent hole. That permanent hole causes generally left to right flow since left atrial pressure is higher. And its problem is volume overload shunts. And rarely does it cause a stroke. Kind of washes off of there probably in the way the, way the anatomy works. PFOs are associated with stroke, aren't associated with volume overload. There is no physical exam finding whatsoever, and so we go looking for it, we find it. We shouldn't go looking for it in everybody, by the way, although the numbers are 25, maybe 30 percent of the population, because only a small percentage of those will have a stroke. But that question comes up a lot. We treat family members who have a PFO, and they say, well, it runs in the family. I'm like, well, it runs in every family. I don't, you know, it's, it's so common. So we, we go through that fear of some patients and screening their family. And this is just the embryonic, uh, just remembering what this looks like in utero for each one of us and the fact that the lungs are full of water, we need oxygenated blood, and it comes from the placenta up the IVC. And for this reason, anatomically, it's a great design in utero, a bad design when we're out breathing the air. That is, you station valve directs blood from that inferior vena cava across, hits the PFO. That PFO tunnel directs it across to the LA, you get oxygenated blood, all's well. If you have DVT and clots and things in your lower extremities and you still have that anatomy, particularly the prominent eustachian valve, which I'll show in a moment, well, that's not such a good thing. So most of us, 75% uh, have crazy glue that glues that together in the first couple months and makes the fossa from the foramen, but some don't, and a fairly large number don't. This, is, this I've seen a couple of times, and this is the only patient in whom we can say, hey, you had a stroke from your PFO, only one. And so we see these, and we try and take care of these. Don't go stirring this thing up, by the way. Um, this is when we call Mike Reardon and other colleagues and say, hey, you want to go kind of help us with this before it becomes much worse? And, and frankly, some of these patients, so they, this is a bad thing to have. The tricuspid valve in this luckily catch most of this. So it, it snags this snake as it's running through. And so you don't want to get rid of the snag until you're ready. So clinical clues, well, DVT is one, migraine is another, and usually migraine with aura suggests more turbulence. Um, recent prolonged travel, we all know to ask these questions. Sleep apnea tends to be one, and we're so, that's so high on our radar now that it's become more prominent and prevalent. Um, waking up with a stroke, so not, not when moving, but waking up with it is one piece, and then valsalva maneuver, weightlifting, et cetera. Um, increasing right-sided pressures, increased right-to-left shunt, propate and foramen, maybe that's a problem. So TCD, I show this for academic interest because our academic center doesn't have TCD. So I show it and say, well, this is really cool, but we've never used it. It's, it's a very nice tool. It's typically isolated to places that can do it well and reproduce it well, and we can't, so we don't. We've decided that if we can't do it well, we're not going to do it. But it's a very elegant way to look for this. Very useful in kids with not much bone in their uh, skull, but um, with adults it's tougher 
But if you can get this, this shows turbulence. It's really helpful with the migraine population, too, because you'll see up to the grade five where it's just turbulence all the time. And one of the, as I was doing my literature dive, and by the way, I do have a literature folder, which I'm happy to share, and I'm sure we can work that out with Brittany so we have it available on Dropbox or someplace. But that's the value of this for me, and then hopefully for you, as we've done a recent literature review, and there it is for you. But in that literature, it's 50 to 300 to 50,000 events um, over a very brief period of time, maybe minutes to a few minutes, when they're showering. So it's like, you know, the odds for creating an event when showering with this are extremely high. Luckily, the showers don't happen often, but when they do, it can be something. So this is just a quick still frame. TEE is probably the, the most common and one of the most sensitive and specific ways to look for this. I value it as an uh, interventionalist and structural uh, heart person in that it helps me plan my procedure like it all does all of us who are procedurally operatively working. Um, it also helps to make sure that we're not missing something or misdiagnose something. For an ASD, as an aside, and I think I mentioned this later, um, I will try to get cardiac MRIs, but we're back to our reimbursed world, and they're, I have the hardest time getting those done on patients where it seems perfectly reasonable to me, but not to the insurance company. But if you've got an ASD, particularly if you're young, I want to make sure there aren't other congenital anomalies so I'm not treating the wrong thing again, or, or mistreating or undertreating. So this is a patient of mine. This patient came to me from another hospital in Atlanta and worked at the hospital as a, as a, in medicine and had four events of transient blindness. And um, the hospital she was at was reluctant to treat this. And she was on anticoagulants and then antiplatelets and wanted to have children. And that's a big deal in young women in particular. So teratogenic meds can't do it. So it's, it's one piece of freedom we can get from this. And this is a dramatic one is why I put it up there. This is, I call this smoke signals, but this is really something. So this is a bubble study, right atrial fill, left atrium here, TE echo, because it's behind the left atrium. And there you see these sort of smoke signals going up there, just very impressive bubbles. And also has color flow evidence. This is the PFO tunnel, the septum primum, septum secundum, patent frame in a valley, which is a tunnel. Fortunately for our procedural um, simplicity, the tunnel, as I described, is directed such that when you come up and bump off the eustachian valve, the wire, you know, I, I'm happy to have things easy. That's all well, we all want it when we can. And it typically will just steer the wire right across, just like it does the blood. <laughs> so um, percutaneous closure, ASDs, 1976, Rashkin clam cell, 1992, clamshell for PFO. So that's the time frame. And then the clamshell device has since been shown to be not the best. So, so there have been two different, I'll, I'll get to this in a moment, of the types of devices we see and what they perform. So if we look at the general population, fascinating stuff. PFO, 20 to 25 percent. Atrial septal aneurysm in about 2 percent. 83 percent of people with an atrial septal aneurysm have a PFO. So most atrial septal aneurysm, you will find a PFO. Then if you take patients 18 to 60, so a stroke population, cryptogenic, then PFOs are found in 50 to 60 percent. So of that population, very high incidence of finding a PFO. So thus, 2.3 fold increased risk of PFO or the presence of a PFO is predicted at that extra incidence. And then by probability theory, by smarter people than me, this is Dr. Saver, by the way, I mentioned this paper and I use it a lot. I plagiarized a lot. He did a terrifically, this is in a stroke, American Heart. And he's, um, he did a terrific review, and he and his colleagues on this paper also were in the RESPECT trial. Um, but this is the best review you're going to find. It's very up-to-date. It's this year, so it's in March. Um, great review, and I've got those for you. So he goes through this, and his probability theory tells you that if you find a PFO in that group of patients with a stroke, it's about 75% of those patients that was the causative agent. So it's a nice piece of information to have. These are the incidence numbers updated from my prior talk, so these are more current, so U.S. and the world, and you can see the numbers are pretty high, and you go down this flow sheet of excluding the various populations, you take patients over 60 and exclude them. Now, I close patients over 60, but you'd like to have a higher bar and more reasons. I just did one recently in a 72-year-old who's had recurrent DVT, had a stroke, and can't take their anticoagulants. Well, that's probably a good reason to take care of them and they've done fine since, but it's tricky, um, much like we might use the watchman for atrial fib in closing that. 
Um, but as we do in medicine, as Joe brought up, a lot of it is a gut check of what's the right plan, and you have good, long conversations with the patient. So we take that group of patients, then cryptogenic is a subset of 30% of those, and then again, that 50-50 chance that they'll have a PFO when you, when you go investigating that. So to close or not to close, it has been controversial, and it still is. Controversy is a little more settled. Medical therapy carries, so this reminds me of our carotid stenting um, and surgical and other things. It's so low risk and so well done with carotid stents surgically when you get out of the hospital the same day. That's a tough bar. If we take other things we do where the improvement, TAVR is a great example of prolonged hospitalizations, and Jim Counton's sitting here, one of our uh, main TAVR surgeons, um, you know, to see the progress we can make, the cost savings, the patient's quality of life, it's huge. This stuff is softer. Um, they do well on medical therapy, and so you have to be careful to kind of give them the choices in a fair way. So what was done by the FDA in the United States, where this was approved in Europe a decade earlier, um, was the bar had to be not just as good as medical therapy, but better than. And that's been the stumbling block for about a decade with the trials. It was as good as, but not better than. And only recently we've shown it's better than, and that hints the approval. So low procedural risk of the device therapy, randomized trials, again, equivalent, and then no superiority until more recently. And so here's just a quick run through. These are the trials, and I'm just going to put this up and show it and move on. But the trials themselves showed equivalence or disappointing results and then differences in types of therapy. Generally, these are two therapies. It's Amplatzer device and the Gore Helix were the two early, and this was starting in around 2000, 2003. We had a great deal of trouble, I did at our place and many of us, enrolling in the RESPECT trial even because it required a second stroke. So not only did you have a first stroke and then on therapy, we had to meet with you and then wait for a second stroke. And that was really the biggest difficulty. Um, and most people wouldn't sign up. And much as we see with COAPT is a good example for our mitroclips. If you could go to a center across the street and get it done, you could. The disappointment is, and I feel bad for this and felt guilt on a regular basis, um, and I'm not Catholic, but I felt guilt on a regular basis um, <laughs> because we would not be enrolling in the trial and helping figure this out. So they talk about that being people who just thought it was a great idea. That wasn't me. I just was trying to take care of the patients, and it put us in a real dilemma, so I'm happy to not have that guilt. There are other sources of guilt, but not that one. Um, so, Peyton Frame in a Valley, this is, this is from the PC trial, not a great name for today's world. Um, this was with Ann Platzer. Then there was the RESPECT trial, and these were in 2013, the, the, as they went through about that decade, a long time, getting to just 25 events. The problem with RESPECT in particular, it was a low event rate in the control group. So, all the events were so low, it took us year after year after year to get enough patients. And you can see these, these follow-up pieces, and then nine patients in device group 16 in medical therapy of primary endpoint, which was recurrent stroke. And it failed to meet superiority. This was the 13 results. Now there's the long-term results. This one was published in 17 from the respect investigators. And finally, we've gotten there. And this is a nice timeline. This is industry supplied through uh, Abbott, but it's a, a summary of these trials. And so you take 2000. 12 and 13, that initial trial didn't show superiority. Then we went to respect 2015 when we could follow that longer and more patient years. And then suddenly we were seeing this 54% relative risk reduction in favor of device closure. And now we're up to, if you take out the intention to treat group, and that's always a confounding variable when there aren't many events, that is, you're supposed to get medical therapy, you get crossed over, or you're going to get a device and you get crossed over to medical therapy. It's always part of our trial designs. So if you take those out and try and just look at pure devices, it was up to 62% relative risk reduction in favor of the device. Hence, I've been much busier of the last year, I'd say, year and a half since this approval than I had been with PFOs, and I'm happy to be. We, we at our place and you at larger places, I'm sure, focus our efforts on low volume, um, high intensity, or low volume certain skill set procedures to few operators, which makes sense. And so... Uh, myself and one other in our now Charlie 100 cardiologist or so practice, um, that's it. So it funnels the work, but it keeps the skill sets up. Um, so uh, among adults who have a cryptogenic stroke, closure of PFO is associated with a lower rate of recurrent ischemic strokes than medical therapy alone. And there you go. And that's the extended follow-up 2017 results of respect. 
I'm going to move right through this. I love this quote, and I'm going to read this paper later. I couldn't, couldn't get it through the web uh, quick enough. But development of PFO closure device therapies followed the five stages life cycle common to technological advances. Technology trigger, peak of inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, and plateau of productivity. <laughs> That's just, ah. Uh. Um, and so this is the PFO occluder, which I think everybody's familiar with. I'm going to move to a quick... This is, this is the fun stuff I want to try and focus on. So here's some pictures, y'all. Um, being from Georgia, I'm from Virginia originally, but we can throw in y'all just like it's part of a regular conversation. So here we go, and this is the atrial septum here, and you can see that there's a tunnel. This is the aorta. There's not a lot of limbus that is primum to work with, but our surgeons are such good colleagues. Jim and I had conversations several years ago about closing ASDs in particular, and sometimes the PFOs, and I'd say, Jim, you know, I don't want to override the aorta. We've got to be extra careful of that. And he said, you have more room than you think, and we have your back. So we basically will approach those in whatever way we think makes sense, and I will go into this with patients, particularly, again, ASDs that are large, as a, I'll close it if I can. If I can't, we'll just step back and say this was, you know, we'll find another way. So this is just looking at the atrial appendage, making sure there's not clot, always important. This one's interesting. This was a very recent case in May, as I pointed out. So very prominent eustachian valve, and that's important. As a matter of fact, it's one of those that almost creates another chamber in the right atrium. So it's a big deal for this guy. There's the tunnel with a little color flow. This is a nice picture of it here. So very prominent eustachian valve here. And then this is the PFO tunnel here. And you can see coming up IVC, and this isn't quite a bicable view, of course. But in that view, it directs it right toward that septum. There's another view of it. Interesting anatomy, because you can see the tricuspid valve down here. And this is all right atrium, almost bisected by that eustachian valve remnant. And here we go with some bubbles again, just like you saw before, bubbles went across. This patient did well. I'll typically do outpatient TE and then ICE-directed procedure, um, and that's, that's a good strategy. If they live very far away, then I'll try and just combine those procedures as much as I can. And if you have a very large atrial septal aneurysm or tunnel, and this one's pretty big, um, and a very floppy atrial septal aneurysm redundant atrial septum, that's a trick. And um, what I've found with those, we've tackled them anyway, but like you see here, it's a self-centering device. So it's going to center over here where this tunnel is, and there's a lot of loose septum. So trying to get it to go premum to premum and be more firmly secured is going to be tough. So they self-center. Well, that could be a problem if they center off to one side. Um, and ideally, you want the device to secure the septum premium and capture the atrial septal aneurysm. That's at least my non-literature supported, but makes good sense to me. Let's get rid of all the pathology. So I'll try and kind of cinch up that atrial septum and do the best we can to reconstruct a nice firm septum there. So this patient, that's what happened when I tried to go through the tunnel. And it's very much overriding the aorta, as you'll see it pop up. Aorta here, right atrium, left atrium. And you see this override. That's dangerous. That's a problem. That's the rare occasion in the past of aortic erosion, which is almost uniformly fatal several months out. So we don't do that. So once I saw that, I still wanted to give this patient closure, pardon the pun. So what we do is I do a transeptal puncture. So I'll take the septum try and go in the middle. Here we're measuring the depth of that tunnel, which, by the way, exceeds the tunnel length, so it will dog bone the device off in two. If it's squeezed out, it just it won't flatten. So this exceeds that problem. And I've measured across, and it's about 35 millimeters, so we're going to choose a device that I can center and get 35 millimeters of coverage. And that would be a cribriform 35, for instance, with equal discs. So here you go, and this is the tunnel. Just a whole lot of flow there. And this is the tenting of this big septum. We use a Bayless device generally instead of Brockenbrow, especially for these patients, because a Brockenbrow is pure force. So you force this far enough, you're going to go great through that septum and right through the roof of the left atrium. Not a good plan. So this, with a Bayless, you can use a little more finesse and burn through. And that's what, what I did here. And then in this next picture, it's a nice shot of how this is now through the middle of the septum, and you can see the tunnel opening and closing over here. And then you can capture all of this material. With the self-centering device is actually a benefit at that point. And here it is in these views. That's the first one I showed when it was in the tunnel. This is the one when it's centered in the septum. Captured everything. And if you're really scrutinizing this, you'll see the tunnel is somewhat partly exposed beyond there. 
but it'll seal over, and I've not had one yet that didn't fully seal. So it cinches it up enough when the, when the endocardium grows in on this device, it takes care of it. So in summary, because again, I'm trying to stay timely here for the team, CVA in a young or middle-aged individual, and they took middle-aged up to 60, less than 60. Um, Transthoracic echo with bubbles, TEs ideal, PFO present, talk to neurology, um, and I always like them part of the team. It fascinates me how many patients with hospitalist systems we've built will be in a hospital, even as a young person, have a stroke and never see a neurologist. And I'll say, well, who's seen you? Well, nobody. I'm like, oh my gosh. So, one of my jobs is to bring the team together with the neurologist best I can, because you sure want everybody on the same page, and I need their expertise to make sure we're doing the right thing. Now, if you're young and it's obvious, we're gonna go ahead, but for those in-betweens, it's helpful. Telemetry, if you're very young, 30, 20, 30, um, you don't need an event or Holter monitor. If you're in that kind of middle age group, um, then it's probably more reasonable to do a Holter or an event monitor, something a little bit longer. Test for thrombophilias, DVT, cryptogenic and negative AFib, then consider closure. And the pieces that give you more um, bang for your buck, atrial septal aneurysm presence, large tunnel, and um, also the eustachian uh, valve and or Chiari network. So I showed you all three in that last patient. That was just last month. So patients with CVA with migraines, they're going to get a bonus. Usually the migraines get better. They may not go away, but usually the incidence most of the time goes down. So that's a bonus for them. Conversely, I don't close them for migraines. That's where part of the controversy came up, unless a neurologist pushes hard. I had the chief of neurology at a local institution send me a patient who had refractory daily migraines and was debilitated. She hasn't had a migraine since we closed her four years ago. So can be remarkable, but it's a selected population. Oh, this, this piece of high altitude, military, um, these have all come up, and I'm getting more and more of these lately, too. We've done some sleep apnea, uh, ceramobosri, one of our echo docs who does our interventional echoes. We were doing a patient of hers that was a diver. He had sleep apnea, so when we had doing the TE and I was closing it, that septum was just forced, and you could see all the flow, so it's an interesting physiology. So that, that finishes here, and with that, I'll close. Thank you.